Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about using the internal brace as an augmentation to traditional ligament repair or reconstruction within sports medicine. We have with us in the studio Dr. Jeffrey Dugas from Birmingham, Alabama, Dr. Thomas DiBerdino from Hartford, Connecticut, and Professor Gordon Mackay from Sterling, Scotland. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. Pleasure. Thanks for Pleasure having us, Chris. Here. So, Gordon, what is the internal brace? Good question. Well, the internal brace, we realized there was a glass ceiling in what we could achieve with allograft or autograft. And although our surgeons 40 years ago had attempted to repair tissues directly, we realized with the evolution of technology, we could, we could approach this problem again. So we wanted something that was biocompatible, something that was strong enough to facilitate early mobilization, but simply acted as a check rein and was not a synthetic ligament, but would allow us to accelerate rehabilitation. So the internal brace is a two millimeter support that requires not less fixation and mimics normal anatomy. And what inspired you to implement this into your sports medicine practice four years ago? I've always been a great admirer of Sir William McEwen, probably Scotland's most famous surgeon. And he taught his students to question everything, said that every textbook was a scrapbook of the one that went before. And he became famous because he challenged the idea that pus was essential for healing 100 years ago. And he'd introduced antiseptic techniques which transformed surgery. He became a founding father of orthopedics and changed all other disciplines just because of the application of that simple principle. So we were hoping with simple change in our approach to ligament healing and taking the focus away from allograft and autograft, we could have a similar impact. Thanks, Gordon. That was a uh, great summary. Now, HEU is responsible for treating professional and collegiate athletes with career-threatening injuries. Jeff, perhaps the longest rehab period of any athlete is after an ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction or Tommy John surgery. Can you explain the evolution of incorporating the internal brace into your practice? Sure, Chris. In the large study that we, we did on something like 1,300 UCLs, the average return time was just under 12 months. So this is, it is one of the longest recovery times. If you go to the major leagues, it might be 18 months. So we needed a, the right kid, you know. I needed a high school kid that didn't have 12 months. So it started with something like that. I just needed the right patient. We had the idea, it morphed off of what Gordon had done in the ankle and, and in other places, and we thought maybe we could do this and put it in an extra articular location, anchor it at both ends of the ligament. And uh, in, in 2013, the right kid came through the door and, and we did the first one, and since then it's been, uh, you know, it's been fantastic. Jeff, can I just ask why, why it is so slow, the, re the recovery or rehabilitation period? Is it a, a concern about attenuation, or what, what, what's the issue? Well, in some cases you're dealing with bad tissue, so you almost have two different pathologies here when you're dealing with UCLs. There's the chronic attritional ruptures where the tissue quality is just poor. Those people need tissue. They have a tissue deficiency. The vast majority of the UCLs we cut open in this large series, there were tears, there were partial tears, there were end avulsions, but the quantity and quality of the tissue there was pretty good. So maybe we're doing too much of an operation for half the pathology or three quarters of the pathology we see as the ages of these injured kids gets younger and younger. And we did actually a basic science study looking at comparing the two. The internal brace did at least as well or better than UCL reconstruction in the standard modified Job technique in all parameters at time zero. That is truly amazing. Now Tom, you have the unique opportunity to treat both high-level athletes and those serving in our military. Where do you incorporate the internal brace? As the years go on, I find that we're using it more and more all around the knee. We can use it not only for the ACL to augment or do a hybrid type of repair or augmentation. I've used it in MCL to save kids in season or high-end warriors to get them back six weeks earlier. We no longer have to wait that magical six weeks for an MCL to heal before we go back and do an ACL repair or reconstruction or internal bracing. We can do the internal bracing for an MCL at time zero and go through one rehabilitation and one healing phase and wrap it all together during one injury, one downtime, and get them back that much quicker. Now, Gordon, you've been a guest on Breakthrough uh, before talking about the internal brace for ankle instability. What other pathologic conditions do you treat with the internal brace? Well, we've found it very successful for the lateral ligament complex. We can apply it to the deltoid medially, the spring ligament, and although I don't deal a lot of trauma, colleagues are using it for Liz Frank disruptions and even syndesmotic repairs at the time of fracture fixation. So the applications are wide. And it's interesting when we transfer the same principle to Achilles repair, and simply establish the muscular tendinous length, which is key to function and power in the strongest tendon in the body. If the tissues are left alone, then the remodeling potential is, is enormous. Which again is no surprise because we internally braced the MCL because we knew that an external brace was reasonably effective. We know that 80% of Achilles might heal effectively in a cast or a boot. 
although we don't know what length. So we know that the, the, the inherent potential for healing is there, but what we've got to do is create the right environment, and I think the internal brace does that. I think also, of late, Dr. Clase has repopularized the anterolateral ligament, the rotatorially important ligament in the capsule of the knee. I think, just like the MCL, we can apply it to not only primary, but revisions in, in hyperlax or hypermobile individuals to give us another control of rotation. You can literally just do a double fiber tape internal brace no tissue needed, the tissue's there. It's akin to the brostrum that we just talked about in the ankle. We've got the attenuated tissue. Why not just in time, in the right spot, internally brace the ALL to help protect whatever we're doing to the central pivot, the anterior cruciate ligament, at the same time? There are other uses we found around the knee are with like a patella tendon rupture, much like akin to the Achilles distally. Patella tendon, we can co op the ends together, and we always comment how they look like mop ends. And the last thing we can do or want to do is strangle those free ends in a young person and block the healing. So, much like in the Achilles, the patella tendon repair can be fortified, and I think we can propagate early healing and possibly rehabilitation by doing an internal brace for patella tendon repair. In, in the upper extremity, I've heard, uh, obviously, we're talking about the UCL, but also, Gordon, I've heard you talk about the gamekeeper's thumb. Yeah, fantastic idea, and, and from a patient perspective, tremendous news because the, it's a common injury that is quite disabling the weakness in your thumb in terms of loss of power. Internally brace while the ligament repairs, immediate, immediate restoration of function and return to work, simple things like holding a pen. So that application is fantastic, and we've seen the same thing. It's great hearing Jeff's work with these pictures because we don't see too many in Scotland, but I'm fascinated because that must be such a challenging area and the ability to intervene in these young athletes. But we have had significant experience with the AC joint and disruption of the AC joint. And what we've found is that the dog bone system and so forth, that I think is great for coracoclavicular ligament reconstruction. And what we've realized that if we then not only fix the superior displacement of the clavicle with the coracoclavicular ligaments, but control the AP glide and rotation with uh, our internal brace anteriorly, an extra five minutes to your procedure, plication of the capsule to take out the slack can be very effective, not only in the acute disruption, but also in the chronic situations. You know, Buddy Savoie published a nice study in the mid-2000, about 2008, with direct repair just using a suture anchor and had great outcomes. I think he had 95% or so return to competition by six months. This, with the internal brace, not only are we repairing it, we're creating a check ring, we're creating a backstop, and that allows us to push a little harder. I would be a lot more comfortable pushing somebody into rehab earlier and testing and, and pushing the length tension relationship of a static ligament knowing that I have that brace as a backstop than I would with just a simple suture anchor. Jeff, just want to add to that because that was exactly our experience. We initially had the concept of the internal brace and the potential advantages, but we really wanted to know whether it was necessary. So Tom Clanton at the Stedman Philippine Clinic looked at the idea of direct soft tissue repair and early mobilization to see if we needed this check rein effect. And uh, although they could good repair, that early movement and mobilization did give rise to the risk of attenuation. So we felt justified in applying the check rein so that as long as it's not working as a synthetic ligament, but that check rein, it worked well. Which leads me on to another funny story because we don't see any American footballers. And I have no idea about this throwing game, okay? <laughs> I mean, how, your elbow's not meant to do this, I'm quite sure. It's only for lifting beer. Anyway, I did see a young American student who dislocated his elbow and having no experience really, I internally braced and stabilised his elbow uh, using the same principles again that I'd applied to our lateral ligament repair and he recovered and mobilised very within a fortnight, had full extension and range. But I, it was only afterwards I inquired when I came back to the States what was the rehab and return to play protocol? And then when I heard it was, could be as long as you described earlier, I was amazed. And I had to think that some of that must relate a little to the surgical morbidity in terms of putting in hamstring and, and fixing it to bone. So it's been a learning curve, but that's, it mirrors your experience. I plan to report our outcomes in terms of fortnights, just so we're clear. Fortnights. When, I, when I publish it, I plan to put it all in terms of fortnights instead of weeks or months. <laughs> I think when we talk about bringing a lot of different concepts together, we've got Gordon who's repopularized the internal brace. We've got Greg DeFelice from New York who's popularized the direct repair. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for all of us to kind of think and expand our horizons on, on the combination of repair and internal brace. Take the ACL. It's like a pair of clown pants that have just dropped down. And we put cinch stitches in and we can co opt them to the wall. We can clearly visualize that and we've seen it done and we can believe in it. 
but those may not be the strength stitches. If we add a core tomato steak type fiber tape, a doubled fiber tape, that can be the core to which we then pull up like a shower curtain or those clown pants. We pull it up and we hoist it up and co-opt it up against the femoral, hall, uh, femoral wall for, or akin to a femoral ACL avulsion. And we can see a hybrid type internal brace slash repair of an ACL. You know, it fortifies the repair and gives us more confidence when we have early rehabilitation going forward. Tom, I've heard the internal brace called a lot of things, but uh, tomato steak, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> so along those lines, historically ligament reconstruction with synthetics, particularly in the knee, has not had great success. Why is the internal brace any different? Initially, the results were very good in all comers, and then at two years, they fell apart. And that's what we focused on, is the ones that it did bad in. But we didn't have any of the abilities now that we have to focus on that stratified group that might be most amenable to an internal brace slash repair. So now we can identify them clinically. We can look at them with a strength of an MRI so we can figure out ahead of time which ones may be most apt to be amenable to a, an internal brace or a repair in the, in the case of an acute ACL or a subacute ACL as, as Gordon has reported, even a chronic. So I think now we can better identify those that will do well and so we've already narrowed our, our, our focus onto those that have a better chance of having success. And the techniques are there now. I mean, before we knew what we'd want to do, but now we can be MacGyver. We can get all the instruments that we've come up with technically from the engineering standpoint. We can get them into the tight space of the notch. We can put the sutures discreetly where we want to in each bundle, the AM and the PL bundle, and we can put them up and reapproximate them anatomically and add strength with a core internal brace of a fiber tape. So I think now we've hit it from all ends. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a three-pronged attack, and then we, we uh, still justify the rehab based on the strength of the internal brace that's been supported in the literature. Tom, can I just comment on this? Because it's fascinating that you mentioned uh, John Fagan's work and obviously the military connection yes. and so forth. Initially, the, it was easiest to apply the internal brace philosophy to the collateral ligaments because everyone understood that they, you know, they could put them in an external brace. Nobody complained about that. Maybe 80% would heal reasonably well or maybe not very scientifically exact. But they kind of understood the idea of let's make it more specific, anatomically mobilize early, and that, and that idea went down well. But even I hesitated a little uh, about its applications for the ACL based on that research. So in 2011, I was invited to do a grand round at the Stedman Clinic. And John Fagan came up afterwards and said, Gordon, God, I like that, like that. Why are you not doing it for the ACL? I said, well, there's a guy called Fagan that wrote this paper. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, oh, that's rubbish. He said, it's rubbish. You have no idea how basic, as you say, the technology right. was. He said, you've got to revisit this. So the first case I did was the following week. And uh, it's now almost five years on. And this young lad has normal knee function. And, you know, I kind of joke about it now. But you, you can challenge your colleagues to say, does anyone, you know, after a reconstruction right. have normal knee function? Answer is no. And, this is my first case. You know? And, it, and it, it goes to, without saying that this is internal brace augmentation, not internal brace substitution. Exactly. Correct. You know, and, that, and that may be some of the big difference between what we saw with the synthetics in the knee and other places. Right. This, is a, this is an augmentation. This is a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's in addition to. So. And it's really, the brace is right where you want the brace. I mean, we, we put braces in the outside of big defensive tackle knees, and they're about six inches from the problem. <laughs> Now we're putting the brace at the source, if you think of it like that, just in a simple terms. We're putting the brace where we need the situation braced, within the substance of the repaired tissue. So it makes sense from a, just an engineering standpoint. It's a great point. Where do you want to put the brace? Excellent point. Now, how has the internal brace changed your uh, rehab and your post-op instructions for patients? It's changed a lot for us, Chris, in the UCL world. You know, we, we put it in and we're assuming that the underlying ligament is healed in six weeks. We give it six weeks to heal and then we start a plyometric program, which is a little bit more advanced stress on the ligament. And we have them throwing at the end of week 10. This is as opposed to the end of week 16 or 17, and we've shortened the throwing program a little bit. So the, the total recovery time for these guys is about six months back to competition. That's half the time that, that we see with typical reconstruction. So Tom, has the internal brace changed your patient's return to activity, whether it's sport or military uh, deployment? You know, I think for the, for the warfighter, for the guys that kick indoors for us all over the world and protect us, I think we treat them like high-level athletes. In time, you know, the calendar, you know, their unit may be deploying in six months. If we can cut their rehabilitation down and they can be, get back and rejoin their unit just like our athletes can rejoin their team on the fields of friendly strife, we've done them a great service. We can rest assured at night because we can 
give the confidence to the patient that the brace we've put in that we're calling the internal brace is the right brace. It's not a brace they have to put over their BDUs or their fatigues. They, this brace is right at the source of the problem. It's really augmenting the repair and it's, uh, it's giving protection from an engineering standpoint exactly where the problem is. Because it acts like a check rein, people will say, well, what happens to it? And they say, well, really, it's, once your natural healing takes place, it should be dormant. But that check rein is a bit like a bit of internal armor. In theory, it should apply protection to future injury. And they kind of get the concept of that, very comfortable with that concept, and uh, you know, it makes sense. Okay, so Jeff, now can you describe the basics of uh, your technique? And how often do you incorporate the internal brace for your primary repairs versus a traditional UCL reconstruction? I think it gets back to what we're dealing with pathology-wise, you know, just like what we would see, you know, with, with other ligaments. In, in the UCL, if you see a chronic attritional rupture where the quality of the tissue is bad, that person has a tissue quantity problem. They probably need more tissue. So that's where a graft, you know, in our, in our preference would be an autograft, would be of value because they, they have a tissue deficiency. When, when we're talking about somebody who has good healthy tissue, a high school or college kid that hasn't had chronic attritional rupture or has a partial tear, they don't have a tissue deficiency. So, you know, we can make the decision to go ahead with the internal brace in those people. So to your question, Chris, I would say that I've probably done over the last two years, probably 80% of, of the people that I'm doing UCL surgery on are these younger high school and collegiate athletes. And so I've probably said, I would say about 80% of the ones that I'm seeing now, I'm, I'm doing with the internal brace rather than the full reconstruction. What about any pitchers? Most of them are pitchers. So I, w I think in our series that we're reporting, some somewhere around 80% of the patients are pitchers. Um, we, we have a couple of other, we have a javelin thrower, we have a couple of wrestlers, cheerleaders, gymnasts. Um, but I, I think the vast majority of them, I think 80 something percent are baseball or softball. and. Um, we had a softball pitcher who won two national championships after having this. What's been amazing to me is these guys have found, and I, I, I've stood on the shoulders of people like Gordon and, and Tom and Greg DeFelice, who is, interestingly was one of my classmates in residency. You know, it, it has followed the path. And so to get people back in six months to half the time to get back to competition has made a difference in some of these people's lives and being able to compete their last year of high school or or make it to college. You know, we've had a couple kids that weren't gonna to get to go to college and, and play baseball and be able to do that. Tom, do you perceive any benefit of incorporating biologics into your internal brace surgeries? In the knee, we have. For an ALL or an MCL, we've incorporated ACP. We'll use collagen-coated fiber tape because that's readily available now. And I think anything we can do to get the biology to stick right there to the tissue and make them you know, work as one, if you will, during the reparative process, I think is, is is beneficial. You know, Chris, in, in the elbow, we've only used the collagen coated tape. I haven't used right. the non collagen coated one, and I had an opportunity to go back on one that MRI was looked pretty good. The kid was still painful about eight months out. He was throwing, but he was having pain. And in the end, I think he had a retained stitch in his skin, which it's hard to believe that was what was causing his pain, but I think it was. But I did have a chance to inspect this ligament, and it had completely healed. I had a hard time finding the tape. It was completely incorporated into the underlying ligament, and uh, it, it was it was about as healthy looking stuff as I could imagine. And I, I've only seen it; I only had one one an N of one to go look at again. But I had no interest in cutting into that once I saw it. It looked great, and I'd be interested in what what Gordon said because you've been doing yeah, it for a long yeah. Time. yeah. Well, a couple of things strike me in terms of my practice. One, I would expect some wear, synovitis, erosion, change in terms of imaging or biopsy. Haven't seen any of that remarkably. And I think it's because it acts as a check rein and it's offloaded once the biology heals. Sure. So I've had the same experience in terms of lateral ligaments, re-exploring them, thinking of perhaps it over-constrained the joint and struggled to find it. And suddenly my minute dissection extended as I was looking for its incorporation. But we do have interesting pathology from Peter Millett and his work on rotator cuff studies uh, in terms of how the collagen grows in and through. And what we've seen with check arthroscopies of the knee, once the ACL is healed, it's very hard to identify. And if you do, it's actually slack in terms in, in sure. flexion. Uh, and in the most recent addition to this of uh, evidence was Pat Smith's excellent work in his dog study, which is, I think is in the process of being published, showing how biocompatible the internal brace is and how it's actually achieving function in the dog model that has never been possible before because of the slope of the tibial plateau. So it's all very encouraging in terms of that, the science behind this. And uh, we didn't really touch on earlier, but the science is really important in terms of the essence of a scaffold for ligament healing. And this backs up Martha Murray's studies and other studies that have been published.
So Gordon, in this day and age where cost uh, containment is of utmost importance, how is the internal brace uh, perceived by your local hospital and insurance administration? Well, I, th I think they perceive, they realize the potential uh, in, in terms of cost savings as it's a shorter operation, less theater time, quicker discharge, less rehabilitation, and in a, in a costing model, return to work and function is really important. But I get great pains to explain to them that uh, it's down the line savings that are potential, potential benefits lie really. We have have uh, the possibility to minimise the risks of arthritis, uh, revision surgery rates as published by Webster et al. were very high, especially in our younger patients, 29% uh, in some cases uh, on either the reconstructed side or the unaffected side. So this, this is all expense and it can, in terms of a conventional reconstruction, mean allograft, it means staged procedures in terms of curetting bone tunnels, bone grafting, removing implants. We don't have any of these issues. In fact, the next stage is we're using it for revision situations where you actually have viable healthy tissue that's just been re-injured so we can internally brace that mm -hmm. as a very simple primary procedure utilizing the vital tissues and then doing the ALL with an internal brace or other structures so there's no harvesting. So we're in a situation, we don't always win the arguments, but we're in a situation where we can at least make the arguments and, and the same in terms of boots and casts, risks of DVT, thrombosis, all these issues. You minimise if you can get somebody mobilised early and back on their feet. And this is a consistent trend, as Jeff was saying, about 50, halving the time of recovery generally and enhancing function and the patient's experience. I don't think we can do much more for, in terms of value for money. And are you following these patients, Gordon? I am using the surgical outcome system, which is great because an independently validated outcome system I'm sure you guys have experience of. And it's great because I'm now starting to be able to give sort of hard facts in terms of are, is this approach matching up with conventional reconstruction? And then one year undoubtedly is. At two years, we're now getting a, a bigger population group coming through. And again, it's been very reassuring because at first we hoped for 50% to heal. Right. And even then we thought we'd be doing really, really well. You know, 50% with a normal knee is a fantastic result, an absolutely normal knee, not a reconstructed knee. But uh, we're finding it actually, we're getting compatible, if not slightly better results at two years. So grounds for encouragement and some hard evidence to support what we're doing, although we need longer term studies, obviously. So, uh, so Tom and Jeff, in addition to uh, insurance companies and hospital administration, you also have to deal with uh, players, coaches, agents, even parents. How do you bring up this uh, conversation with them? Many of them understand the time constraints and the need to play, and so it's not a hard discussion at the high school level because the quality of the tissue is not bad, as we talked about. There's not a tissue deficiency. As you get to the collegiate level, again, are we dealing with a tissue deficiency or are we dealing with just something that can be repaired? I still think this, the discussion centers around the actual pathology that we're seeing, which is what makes this so great. As you get to the pro level, now you're talking about an older thrower. I personally would not have a problem doing it in a pro thrower if they had the right pathology. I think though as you get into the pro level, you're probably gonna run into more attritional ruptures and therefore the tissue quality is not likely to be as good. But given the right patient with the right tissue pathology, I wouldn't have a problem with that and the agents would have no, I think we could have that discussion very honestly and I, I think we're developing enough repertoire of data to have that argument even at the highest level given the right pathology, so. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, my analogy, it's akin to a, a light switch where it's on or off. We're gonna reconstruct, whether operative or non-operative, we're gonna use your tissue or somebody else's tissue. Now it's more of a dimmer switch. And patients come to us because we have a body of expertise and knowledge that we've drawn upon from you know, riding on the shoulders of other giants that allows us to then extrapolate into that person's individual knee, treating each knee as an individual knee. My son always asks me, do you get bored doing ACLs every week of your life? And I say, every knee is different. Because if we talk to patients like that and we tell them how differently the actual pathophysiology may be in each given knee, we can respond accordingly. We can do, we can do a little internal brace, a little augmentation, a little graft, a little auto or allograft. I mean, every, we use the word hybrid, that's almost trite because there's so many degrees of hybridization now that we can literally respond to each knee and its intrinsic pathologies individually. And I think that's the beauty of this. And as we, as we look at some of the other, you know, you mentioned the ALL. Right. That, that seems to me a, a chip shot for this type of a technology. It's extra articular. It, what we're putting in there has got to be a thousand times stronger than what was given to us mm -hmm. at birth. And, and so it, it, it's, it's simple, it takes a couple minutes and, and you may be able to, I, I've used that for revisions especially, or people that I think had a primary ALL problem, which I, I think is still, still somewhat 
tough for me as a clinician to sort out, but it's such an easy thing to do. I think it's a great idea. Tom, are you doing Absolutely. the same? I am. In, in almost all revisions, and, and we get the multiply right. revised knee, right. and you can only bang your head against the wall so many times. You get them from other experts, and you're like, well, I know that person does them great every time, so right. who am I? <laughs> so it's nice to have something in our toolbox now to kind of tweak the system, up engineer it, and apply it, you know, just you know, strengthen the repair and put that brace, again, like we mentioned before, right where we need it. It, you know, to have two points to control rotation always makes more sense to me. I mean, we don't need it every time maybe, but certainly in the more difficult, high pivot, hypermobile, revision type setting, I think we should all think about it. Tom, I think I started the same way, and obviously for me it was very natural to do the same thing, to go to the internal brace rather than taking someone's hamstring in that situation, especially if some of that had been used as part of a reconstruction. But initially it was specific indications, and then once you realised that if you, with the knee flexed, if you could just make your origin just behind the epicondyle then, right. then, and, and tension and extension with the foot neutral, then you didn't over constrain that lateral compartment. They were oblivious to it, yet you could get all the advantages that potentially Sonari Cotteri describes in his excellent work in terms of Absolutely. halving his ACL revision rate. But this simple add-on, I mean, to internally brace the ALL, uh, especially based on his anatomical studies, the ALL is only really tensioned when the ACL is heavily loaded in that pivoting manoeuvre. So if you've got that covered, even if it adds 15% of strength, it's easy. And if it adds five, 10 minutes to your procedure, which it does at most, then suddenly I go up to up and up and up. And so it's the hypermobile, it's the young, it's pivoting sport, it's this and this. And in primary cases, not just revisions. So uh, I would say I'm moving towards maybe 65% or so that I would start to apply this, which is a big change in my practice from two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, some great points. So, uh, so final thoughts, gentlemen. We'll start with you, Jeff. You know, this is it's exciting. This has changed our practice, and, and you know, we're, we're all kind of midterm in our practices. We, we've been there, and we've still got ways to go. It's exciting to see change for a good reason, not just change for the sake of change. This is well founded in in both common sense, biology, anatomy, biomechanics, and, and it makes good sense. And it's exciting to see it going in all these different directions in different spots. No longer is it a price fix menu where we have allograft or autograft. We're like, that's it? That's boring. Now we've got a diner menu. We can add a biologics. We can add a collagen-coated fiber tape. We can add a graft if we need to, but not absolutely have to. So now, really, it's really opened up the horizons for what we can do and how we can best treat your knee. I agree. I think uh, I it's great to have feedback from other people's experiences, and I think most importantly, it's evident in our patients' experiences. I think it transforms their their surgical journey and their return to sport or activity or work, and that's been the most satisfying thing by a mile. It's just seeing how simple changes in our own practice can impact on the patient. So I, you know, it's exciting times. I'm delighted with that change, and uh, I look forward to see other applications because I think we have, along with the potential of biologics now, the chance to restore and rejuvenate joints. The potential is within touching distance, sure. undoubtedly. Very exciting. What a great episode. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, joining us uh, today. Thanks for having pleasure. us. Thank pleasure. You. Thank you once again for being part of this breakthrough event and for letting Arthrex help you treat your patients better. A team of Arthrex experts will remain online to answer any additional questions you may have. Also, all the digital assets in this webcast will be available on the Arthrex.com website. If you'd like to view this webcast again, subscribe to our What's New email using the form provided after this broadcast. We encourage you to contact your local Arthrex representative to arrange a visit to one of our surgical training facilities around the world to learn more about the internal brace. We look forward to hosting you again at the next exciting edition of Breakthrough.